thank you, Chair, uh, for this opportunity. And good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, out of all uh, alternatives we have in urban transportation to control uh, greenhouse gas emissions, non-motorized modes is certainly uh, one of the best options we have. So today I'll be talking about how to use these so-called non-motorized modes of transportation in urban, tra urban uh, transportation activity in order to control greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, with a specific case study of uh, Indian city called Mumbai. Uh, uh, popular belief and established fact that yes, Asia is growing and it's urbanizing as you can see uh, the figure and the numbers, it explains that. And uh, as the urbanization is happening, the number of larger cities is also on rise, like seven out of 10 uh, mega cities in the world are located in Asia. And as the cities, both in number and size is growing, um, naturally their contribution to economic development is also very significant. Some of the speakers in the morning also have showed some statistics uh, saying that this particular fact is absurd. And as the cities are growing in economic contributions to the country, uh, it's clearly observed in Asian developing countries that services sector is playing an important role. As the service sector takes a dominant role in economic activity, naturally it ends up in having more of mobility or uh, uh, travel activity. So the transportation as an activity has increased with the increasing urbanization and increasing number of cities and increasing services sector in economic development process. So as you can see, there's a, uh, a need for infrastructure development in urban transport, and Asian cities have been putting a lot of efforts um, uh, towards that. As, as a result of that, naturally, the car ownership is on rise, and cars per kilometer essentially is increasing. That leads to a lot of problems like congestion and so on. Um, another interesting dimension of these cities in Asian countries is as the cities grow in size, the percentage population living in slums, especially a uh, country like um, India, especially has a lot of slum population. As you can see, the table shows the share of slum population uh, in different countries. As the slum dwellers are essentially poor, relatively, uh, compared to other sections of the society in the city environment, uh, the major mobility they rely on is non-motorized modes of transport, that includes walking, of course, and the public transport. Uh, that's what the figures essentially explain you. So due to the change towards motorization, transport sector in Asia is growing as a major GSE contributor. The alarming fact about this is the transportation is going to be more intense in the years to come, and so the GSE emissions from this sector are going to rise significantly. <clears throat> as the cities are gearing up towards the uh, infrastructure development, uh, infrastructure development has a potential, both direct and indirect. As it can say, infrastructure provides the foundations for the present and future consumption patterns. So the moment you don't consider uh, so-called green aspects of infrastructure development, there's a potential of locking ourselves into unhealthy consumption patterns as far as energy con is concerned. All right? uh, at this juncture, when the developing cities are gearing up to develop their infrastructure, uh, what is observed is the following. Infrastructure uh, is motor vehicle centered. Whenever you develop a road, particularly say in India, for example, it is all aimed at how to mobilize the automobiles, how to make them move faster, uh, which is unfortunately, uh, 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 is not including unmotorized modes of other people who are not using motorized modes of transport for their mobility. And lack of long-term urban planning is essentially a problem. Lack of integration with the land use pattern, which would effectively reduce the need to travel. See? And the car-centric infrastructure development results in insufficient and also inefficient public transportation, leaving the vacant sections unattended. Their needs are unattended, which is an issue of equity. Um, by and large, it's making rounds these days. So Asian developing countries with the rapid economic growth patterns that's being observed these days have been pooling up for the infrastructure development. And with the present approach of infrastructure development, cities have a potential to lock themselves into unsustainability, as uh, is explained just now. Now, how do we address this urban transportation sector as far as greenhouse, mit greenhouse gas mitigation is concerned? We have observed that it has a potential to grow as an outstanding GHC emitter. But how do we address that? There are uh, concepts like, we can use this, uh, number of vehicles is one dimension of it, 
and the distance traveled is another dimension of it, and of course, emissions per vehicle kilometer. That means energy efficiency of it. The technology-oriented response strategies are limited to supply side, as I uh, had explained, a supply side management, whose derived CO2 benefits will be easily offset by the rising number of vehicles and the travel activity. So not just like energy efficiency, but also the need to travel and the number of vehicles have to be addressed in tandem. So uh, for that, we need to say build infrastructure for sustainable mobility rather than mobility of cars. Integrate transportation infrastructure development with city planning and changing land use patterns, which can be achieved by decentralization and decongestion activities. Um, India, uh, Mumbai has attempted decongestion by developing uh, as a, a new town called New Mumbai. So there are efforts uh, similar to that in different parts of the world. Then uh, ensure equity in investment. Try to promote infrastructure in a way the needs of all sections of the society are met. Not just motorized modes, but those poor who rely on non-motorized modes and public transport as well. Apply economic instruments uh, to control the use of personalized modes of transport uh, by means of congestion tax, uh, you know, making a vehicle registration more expensive and tedious process, and so on. There are different examples of uh, such mechanisms. Now, uh, in order to make the transportation more GHG friendly, as some of our friends uh, have presented in the morning session, uh, co-benefits approach is perceived to be one of the best ways of doing it. Uh, as we do that, infrastructure to promote non-motorized modes of transport, control travel activity, improve engine efficiency, and improve fuel efficiency, which includes uh, number of vehicles, travel activity, and energy efficiency. As you develop infrastructure to achieve this, you essentially try to see what are the possible co-benefits that we have. The moment you include this assessment of co-benefits in the infrastructure development that we talk about, you end up having an inclusive assessment of the transport system, which is sustainable mobility, contribution towards the co-efficiency of the cities, and then control of GHZ emissions and augmenting the economic growth. How do you do this? While you plan for sustainable mobility, one way is long-term planning, which people go for futuristic planning. The other way is to go for short-term or retrofitting measures. There are projects ongoing which did not consider the so-called co-benefits approach. So instead of waiting for the future projects to come, what are the present projects ongoing, you try to identify what are the retrofitting measures that you think of so that you try to have the so-called so co-benefits which were not considered before. Uh, in the plan, right? In a similar exercise, we did a case study for Mumbai. Mumbai essentially has uh, uh, a lot of population. Numbers could vary uh, uh, with the new census coming in picture. Severe space limitations, Mumbai has a peculiar uh, spatial structure which is unidirectional. A lot of space constraint. Severe congestion we have. Uh, higher per capita income compared to national per capita incomes. We have predominant uh, quasi-public mode, which is uh, neither public nor personal. Like tuk-tuks in, in Thailand, we have auto rickshaws in India. Uh, they are energy inefficient in a way, they are more polluting vehicles as well. But they have a lot of social uh, dimension involved in that. Then we have uh, poor quality service, like you must have seen pictures of uh, Bombay Metro, uh, local trains carrying people uh, more than their capacity. And then, uh, but, Characteristic of Mumbai transportation is efficient mass rapid transit system with a well-spread network of metro rail and bus catching the prime lag of the travel, travel of, uh, in urban transport there. And this takes care of prime lag. And then walking, bus, and other modes of transport, which is averaging at 2.3 kilometers, which is quite healthy for bicycling distance. Uh, they cater for access lag and egress lag. Now, uh, there are projects, major projects in, in Mumbai. These two are completed, these two are ongoing, at the, have almost completed uh, the, their tenure. Yeah, we'll do that. And this is the, uh, you can see the percentage share of different modes in Mumbai. It clearly explains that uh, automobiles are taking a major share, which, act, which cater for access leg and egress leg, which ideally can be taken up by uh, uh, bicycle and walking. So with that intention, we try to find some measures where uh, footpaths and bicycle lanes on all roads that are planned un under these two projects, which were ongoing, 
And then we try to see providing bicycle uh, stand at all rail stations, which are falling under this uh, network of roads, improving road intersections for NMT, and capacity building measures. These are the measures we consider as retrofitting measures for the ex ongoing projects. And when we try to see what is the incremental cost involved in uh, adding these things to the existing products. Then uh, the GHG benefits were calculated by means of three, three wheelers, as I said, the quasi, quasi public good here, quasi public modes of transport. Uh, replacing those three wheelers, how much of GHG benefits you'll get? Uh, that analysis essentially led us to the following results. If you convert the existing roads, 10% of the existing roads to NMT compliant roads, you would get, uh, this would be the cost of the retrofitting measure, and the benefits would be this much of um, 7.6 million tons of GHG reduction. Similarly, for 100% conversion of roads to NMT compliance, um, you have this much of cost involved, and of course, 100% conversion is not practicable. We should always consider less than that. So 74% conversion of existing roads to NMT compliant roads essentially would have given this much of GHG benefit. Okay, as you can see, the marginal cost would be something like 2 to $7 per ton of uh, carbon reduction in the scenario of 10 to 100% road improved to NMT compliance. So these kind of benefits one can derive. As I said, these are short-term benefits. In order to have a complete gaze of these benefits, one has to take up uh, analysis of other core benefits such as uh, air pollution reduction, noise control, accident control, and energy consumption as well. If you include all the benefits together, the core benefits would definitely look much larger and uh, enriched. Okay? How much more time we have? Two minutes more, okay? Now, in order to do this, there are certainly barriers involved. It's not easy to do that. So we try to identify what are the possible barriers uh, in order to go for this retrofitting measure of NMT in Mumbai. We found interesting barriers like uh, lack of proper infrastructure, lack of institutional arrangement to integrate these NMT into uh, mainstream things, lack of uh, legal basis for NMT usage, and poor attitude of people like car driver would look at us, a bicycle person as an inferior creature uh, unnecessarily taking his space. So that attitudes have to change. Unsafe conditions, many people said we don't use bicycle because it's not safe. One can come and hit me and I'm at risk. Poor social acceptability, as I said, uh, bicyclers and walkers are seen as poor people, unfortunately. Uh, lack of national NMT strategies and so on. So in order to avoid these barriers, once we try to find what are the possible policies that should be in place, we found the list of policies as uh, necessary uh, institutions. For example, incorporation of standards um, for the bicycle and pedestrian provision in the road design, which is missing at the moment. Uh, integration of NMT in public transport systems, we don't have it as it. And the formulation of national strategy to promote NMTs and so on. Finally, what we did in a multi-stakeholder group assessment based uh, analysis, what we have, uh, uh, we have considered administrative costs involved in doing this exercise, financial ability, administrative capability to conduct this conversion of roads to NMT compliant, political willingness, and so on. We found that highest priority is given to policies to create awareness and capacity in order to achieve this conversion is given the top priority. Next is policies to integrate NMT in uh, public transport, second priority, and policies to incorporate standards for bicyclists in the design of the road and uh, uh, infrastructure is given third priority. So uh, the points that finally would like to make is controlling GS emissions in Asian mega cities need to reorient towards mobility rather than moving motor vehicles. Uh, while infrastructure development for intermodal transport may be considered for long-term planning, uh, retrofitting measures to the ongoing infrastructure projects may be considered because they also reap a lot of benefits out of uh, the ongoing projects. Short-term measures need to uh, in order to justify, because the product is already on, in order to justify that we need to add these elements, we need to do complete cost-benefit analysis and justify such inclusion. Yeah. And as I said, finally, uh, there is a potential of applying for global environment facility projects because all these retrofitting measures have tangible GHG benefits. And that would be an, uh, 
added advantage, it can go into financial flow of the cities. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much.